It's almost 30 years now since I made Tommy Tricker and the Stamp Traveller for Montreal producer Rock Demers. Over the years I've got lots of fan mail and even today people approach me to tell me how important the film was in their childhoods. And, uh, I was put into the English as a second language class and one of the first films I ever saw in Australia was Tommy Tricker and the Stamp Traveller and it quickly became one of my favorite films. My mum would hire it from the video library and I would wear it thin. I would watch it at least a hundred times, at least a hundred times. Et à partir de ce film, inconsciemment, consciemment, j'ai développé une passion pour explorer, être un aventurier. I think uh, the movie, the effect of the movie that had on my generation and me is uh, tattooed on our soul. It's inside, it went so deep. So it has come to seem like it's really time to tell the story of how the film got made. And it wasn't an easy making in some ways. Now I don't think you'd expect a good story to start in a dentist's office, would you? But that's where I was in Montreal in the mid 80s, waiting to have a tooth filled, when I found a magazine called China Reconstructs. And on page 57, I found a story about a young Chinese boy called Wang Zonggun, who'd won a gold medal from the International Postal Union for his pen pal writing. He'd been writing to a young friend in Canada. And what really intrigued me about the letter was he said that one night he dreamed that he somehow got into the letter or into the postal system and mailed himself to Canada. Now I thought, what an intriguing idea. And this is before the internet, before selfies, before Google. It was a time when kids couldn't travel. You couldn't get away from your parents. Nobody went overseas. So escape through a letter was really a rather amazing idea. And I thought to myself, well, how about a story about a Canadian kid who not only dreams to travel overseas, but finds this magical way to get himself into a stamp, put himself in the picture of the stamp and mail himself away. That probably came because I had been a stamp collector. Not an avid one, but I did love stamps for what they showed me about other countries and set me dreaming of places I would like to go. In fact, soon after that dentist session, I got my old album out, which I guess I haven't opened in 50 years since I looked like this in Australia, way before going to live in Canada. So I had a look through my dear old album, and well, I was shocked. The stamps in it were so drab. The British stamps were so drab. The Indian stamps were so drab. Egypt was only interesting because they put bars through the head of the king they had deposed and were saving money on the stamps. I couldn't quite remember how these stamps, these monochromatic stamps, or at the most two colors, had set me dreaming of travel. I was learning stuff that the British were monarch obsessed, that the Yanks were very boastful, that uh, the French were sexy, like that. That Canada was very modest. Its uh, hero stamp was a fishing schooner. And uh, New Zealand was kind. But where was the travel inspiration? And then I found this page pulling out Concertina which had some rather nice stamps from the Pacific area on it. Little scenes of fishing and village life and so on, and always with the British king in the corner looking over everybody. This one I especially loved for the story it told, and it's 
It's no accident that the first foreign country I visited in my late teens was Fiji. I think it was those stamps that set me going. And also one that was multicolored, very unusual for the day. I loved this stamp here. So I thought to myself, well, you could never make a story with such drab material. I wonder what the stamps are like today, because I sort of lost touch. I mean, I was vaguely aware that they were colored. So I went hunting into the stamps of 1985, and I found they were fantastic. The British stamps had just become amazing. And what fun it was to find out that they had no country name on them. And this was in honor of the fact that, that Great Britain had invented the postage stamp. Canada was even very interesting with curious, sort of strange people on the stamps. Australia too. Stamps that were very much kid-focused and great. And the Soviet Union was managing to be a bit playful. And all the little countries were obviously getting into the stamp game and making these evocative stamps that just set the imagination racing. Planes to take your places, wrecked ships, sailing galleons. All sorts of stories and intrigues were in the stamps. And it wasn't just boy stuff, there was stuff that would interest girls too. Wonderful animals and ballet dancers and just beautiful stamps. Beautiful, beautiful. The French stamps with their engravings were particularly evocative and romantic and full of imagination. And China, very delicate. And of course at this point I had no idea that I would be taking my story to China. I must say I found it so exciting. There were stamps for every interest, for music, for sport, art, for kids' hobbies, and, and even stamps about stamp collecting itself. So anyway, very encouraged by what had happened to stamps, I went and spoke to my producer, Rock Demez, and said, look, I've got an idea for a film about stamp travel, and stamps today are great. We can find wonderful stamps for my character to go around the world on. Well, Rock was very keen. He thought that was a good idea. Then I found there was a huge problem. I was too late. The hobby of stamp collecting, as far as young people was concerned, was dead. They weren't collecting stamps anymore. I went to a get-together of hardcore collectors. I collect uh, Canada, I collect Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, where I fought my war years. Anything to do with, with uh, stamps and Russia, covers, uh, all of it. I'll give you uh, my, I'll, I have a card. Okay. That should make it easier. Okay. I've been collecting stamps for 65 years since I was 22 years old. That makes you 87? Yes. And did you make uh, a career out of this or was it always just a hobby? No, well I tried. I tried on two occasions to make a living at a store. Right. Didn't work out. And I found only one young boy with his trophy. Everybody else was relatively old. And in fact, the most interesting guy there was 87. He was a sweetie. Get be glad, be glad to be of any help that you want. Wonderful. I will. So what had gone wrong? I think that postal authorities around the world got too greedy. In the old days, people bought stamps to put them on letters and send them. But now, every little country was getting into the act and making stamps their main export item. So this meant that, you know, your uncle who took stamps off letters and um, saved them for you, and you put them in your album, he wasn't getting any of these new stamps and nor were you. 
and the only way you could get them was to go to a uh, stamp shop and buy them. They were very expensive, especially sets. And if you had one stamp, you'd want the set. And so kids, I think, just dropped out of the hobby. It was too expensive. They killed the golden goose. What to do? Well, I had a crazy idea. The pictures were wonderful, but kids couldn't afford them. The pictures were there for dreaming. I thought I'll make what I call big stamps. These will be photographic reproductions of all the most beautiful stamps in the world. And they will be cheap for swapping. And that way, the whole stamp thing can be revived on another plane. Well, didn't work. So, the next thought was that, okay, stamps are out of fashion, but scheming, scams and trickery never are. So if I could create a character who is not particularly interested in stamps, but sees them as a way to scam his friends, that could be somebody who could draw the young audience into a stamp story. Well, I was very lucky because at that same stamp convention, there was a guy there talking about something that had just happened that Canada Post had put out what's called a variety. Now, I knew that a variety is an error, and that errors on stamps are valuable. They had inadvertently put out this pink triangle on a stamp down in the corner of the block. So, here's the stamp as it's supposed to be, and here's the pink triangle, the error. And guess what? They sold out! <laughs> they're, they're I couldn't, when I went down to get my four corners, I couldn't get that kind of job. Of course, in Toronto, you should have seen them buying up. <laughs> they were just lined up and people, we're not the talking about buying the one all the way to the bank. Set. Hundreds of plate block sets to get one corner. And I thought, what luck is that? That I have something in the real stamp world that I can build into my plot and I can have my little trickster exploit that. Here, check these out, man. Oh, wow, Tommy, they're pretty. See that little pink triangle in the corner there? That's a mistake. On a stamp, a mistake could be worth a fortune. A fortune, Tommy! The pink triangle was a great find, but it couldn't be my major plot point. It was a minor stamp. But then I had another lucky break. Canada's most famous stamp, the Blue Nose, the one I'd had in my album, it also had a variety, an error called the man on the mast. Just a dull little mark actually at the top of the mast, which we later made much better with a real little man. But that could be my plot driver because that was a big stamp and the man on the mast variety was worth serious money like $500 or something. And then as a bonus I thought well, I'll make the, the Mountie stamp the carrier. So I wrote all this up I took it to Rock, he thought it was good, luckily, and then it was a matter of finding my cast, who I was absolutely determined would be amateurs. I knew exactly how I wanted to work. I would go to schools, always grade six of primary schools, and I would tell the story, acting it out, all the parts, grimacing and getting the kids involved in it. And then when that was done, I would invite everybody in the class who wanted to, to come up and to try a scene, improvising on what they'd heard. No script, just improv. And then I'd tape all those sessions and when I found a kid who was promising, I would share him with Rock. And I'd done that before. Here's me with another story. And as they're flying along in the plane, Rock had come to trust this strange way of working. My God, what's happened? The engine's starting to the engine's starting to miss. The engine's uh, stopping. And slowly the plane sinks down towards the jungle. Okay? In fact, and Rock came to hear one kids. of my storytelling sessions. Kids, I'm sorry, and it was that that danger. convinced no him that, like this could that the film was a goal. Because uh, he said the kids, the kids thought they'd the seen the movie. Uh, 
and the plane comes down and down and it goes into the trees and it crashes into the trees and the wings are ripped off and the fuselage plunges down into the forest and the father is terribly injured and the pilot is killed. One day a journalist turned up uh, intrigued that I was going to make a major movie with amateurs, with kids who'd never acted before. Why would I do that? Because I got fresh talent. I wanted kids who loved the process and who would be grateful. Not little spoiled brats who'd been in TV commercials. No, didn't want them at all. And no stage mums sitting around to drive me crazy when I didn't give their kid enough lines. And so I didn't want any of that. So here I was going from school to school trying kids out for the parts. Firstly looking for Tommy because he really was the core of the story. I had to find my trickster. I knew he would be a kid from the other side of the tracks or at least look like that. Tough little kid. This, this boy here for instance, he had the look that I wanted. And I remember photographing his, not only his shirt, but also his broken shoes, thinking that my Tommy might well wear shoes like that. The other plus from this laborious process was that the story got better and better. This is because I would hear it coming back to me in the words of the kids themselves, how they spoke. Uh, these are out of style. Oh. Um, I valuable stamps here? Yeah, my father's um, but I don't think I can touch it. He'll kill me. Just get it. No, he'll kill me. I was not only looking for Tommy, but I was also looking for Ralph, who's a victim boy, takes his father's stamp when he shouldn't. It is brutal. And then there was Nancy, his pretty much caring sister who helps get him out of trouble and who's very wary but fascinated by this Tommy Tricker character. Um, who are you? I'm Tommy Tricker. I'm famous. What are you famous for? No, breaking into houses, stealing silverware, hot wiring a car down the street, you know, wrecking the principal's car, things like that. That's not a good thing to be famous for. Why not? It's fun. Yeah, you know, but that's not the point. You're supposed, you're not supposed to be like that. I hope you're not influencing my brother. I find it a bit sad that these kids threw themselves so eagerly into these improvs and... Uh, so here they are today in their late 30s, somewhere in Canada, and they've never seen these precious tapes that I've kept. Just pick up your socks and you'll mistake. Thanks a lot! Don't insult me! That's rude! That's ignorant! That's, that's not right! You walk into my house, barge! Right in, and then you just tell me my socks stink, and my room's a mess. It's not very nice, you know, so it's true. Indeed, one of the strange aims like of that. this film that I'm doing here... Being rude about it. <laughs> That's life. ...is to reunite those kids with their performances of long ago. Tell you what. See, Don't let him touch it. Don't let him touch it like that. <sighs> tell you what, damn it. You see these two blow noses here? Blue yeah. Noses. Okay. I'll trade you these. This past set here, all six of them, for just that one old crumpled blue nose. There was a, a danger to this way of working, and that was that uh, sometimes an improv would be so fascinating that it might tempt my story in a slightly new direction. What's yours? Tommy. That's a nice name. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> you here to see Ralph? This pair here, oh, Ralph? this yeah. Tommy yeah. and this Ralph. Nancy, for Ralph. example. I was so taken with the way they interacted w with each other that I just lost perspective, I guess. Try and find out something about him. I'll have water. Oh, okay, I'll get in a sec. So, um, what do you like? I like Jim. I like, uh... I like junk food. I kind of know Very this. Jim. Oh. Uh... Any sports? I like, uh, I really like, uh, wrestling. Wrestling, yeah. Wrestling. You uh, go out on dates, right? Uh, well, well, then, I mean, uh... You got a girlfriend, right? Well... Cute guy, like, he's got a girlfriend. Not, well, not too, well, um, 
Not, not anymore, no. Really? Uh, no, oh, yeah. oh. Neither do I. Well, my girlfriend. Yeah. I don't have a boyfriend either. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. I did. You did? Yeah. Old news. What's this? Uh, who? Jeff. <laughs> Jeff? Jeff. You went out with Jeff. Yeah. You don't like Jeff? The guy has an IQ of a beach ball. <laughs> well, he, he, I didn't like him. I was before, absolutely so convinced that this was my Tommy <laughs> and my Nancy. Did you about having a girlfriend? Well, if you found the right person, right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. definitely if, if I find the, found the right person. Yeah, me I too. Would. Yeah. Well, I took this tape to Rock so keen on these two, and um, he wasn't. He said, you know... Um, you're twisting the story towards a teen romance, and it's not that. It's a trick. It's Tommy tricking Ralph. That's the core of your story. And besides, these two are too old. They look like mid-teenagers. He was absolutely right. And uh, for a while, I was really down. I went back and looked at Tommy after Tommy after Tommy with Ralph's and Ralph's, but none were quite right. Stamps. Come on, look. Look at this stamp. It is I was crazy. down too because it was the beauty of stamps which got me into the story. And here I was stuck in trickery. And so then I decided that I'd switch gears and I would look for another character. Ralph. This boy in green, for instance, had given me an idea as to how Ralph was vulnerable and needy. Come on, come on, there's one right there. Come on, please. Uh, come on, I gotta run there. And this other boy with the red hair, he'd also touch something in terms of what I was looking for with Ralph. I don't, I'm not really sure about this. Do it anyway, it doesn't matter. Good. This is, this is tortured. This is indecision. Just do it. Incredible. I love it. And so there I was uh, at a school way in the west of Montreal one day, and the kids were lining up as they always did to say their names and give me their phone numbers so they could be found again. And the teacher says to me, be careful, Lucas Evans probably won't try out because he's got a very bad stutter. Well, I was intrigued. Lucas Evans, 453 And she said, if he does, be gentle with him. I said, well, of course. Ralph, it's something to see you. Uh, Tommy, uh, hi. Uh, how, how are you? I'm okay. How are you? Fine. Uh, do you want some, something? I got something for you. I don't see anything you'd like. They're all pretty boring. Anyway, this Lucas, not only did he do an improv, but I, I couldn't hear any stutter at all, really. I couldn't hear any stutter. And I thought, what courage this boy's got, you know, with this speech impediment to get up there in front of everybody and do this. And it was that courage that convinced me that I wanted him for my Ralph. Well, my mother's sick at home, and i got to get home to her. I don't know. Come on, six for one, it's a great deal. Took him to Rock? And Rock said, well, you're making a problem for yourself because on the set you might have to do take after take to get a clean one. And you know, amateur kids can't repeat and repeat. They lose the magic. He was right. But I was absolutely adamant that this was my Ralph. Hey, and I felt magic. there was something very good luck time. about it. One stamp from Dad's, from Dad's book. You went in Dad's book? Well, come on, it was a great deal. It was one stamp for six He's and gonna ones. skin you. And so then I thought, I'll go after Albert, the nerdy, pompous head of the stamp club at the school, because I know exactly what he's like. And, uh, in fact, somebody told me, maybe it was Lois, my assistant, somebody told me there was a boy in Ottawa who was running a lawn mowing business <laughs> and that he would be perfect for the part. What I basically do is I go around to people, ask them if they want their lawns mowed, and most of the time they say no, but I've become lucky and gotten a couple of customers. I have a, my own accountant, me. I have my own person to push the lawnmower, me, and I am the president. Um, do you pay taxes? 
No taxes paid yet. So far, I'm only up at $10. The company's status right now is owning $1.70. Oh yes, and I'm trying to buy a gas lawnmower that was bought for $300 by a friend of mine named Ronnie, and he's selling it to me for $30. And that's basically it. <laughs> he was perfect. The question was, though, could he translate his nerdy, pedantic character into a stamp thing? Because he didn't have any interest in stamps. Could he come across as the stamp president? What do you mean? Listen, you can't have life without rules. Rules are life, okay? You can't live without them. For instance, I know something about this stamp swapping of yours. Yeah? Yeah. No. Yes, and I know it's strictly against the rules. I didn't do anything. Well, as the way I've heard it, you have been swapping stamps with this guy, Tommy Tricker. Now, you know he has been expelled. Yeah, well, I traded good stamps. Yes, but did you get good stamps back? Yeah. Are you sure? Pretty sure. I, I finished my collection. I didn't... I don't play with Tommy Trigger. You don't believe him, by the way, and you must have some proof, actually. Something up your sleeve. Well, I have heard this from your sister, okay, Nancy. My I take it. I take it Nancy's his sister, okay. She said that to me that she... he shortchanged you. Okay, by giving you faulty stamps. Nancy said that? Yes. Well, I, I believe this is satisfactory proof. Now, if you don't get this straightened up and you stop messing around with him, I can maybe get your place in this stamp collection, collector's thing a little more solid. And that was a whole chain of events started then. Because the boy that he was with, the dark-haired boy, was a good Ralph. But, of course, I already had Ralph. But he was good, and he did a scene with a possible Tommy that was really quite exciting. Oh, come on, just one peek. No, no. So don't be chicken. Are you chicken? You know, are you chicken? Oh, that's a Get that down, come on. You can turn the pages. You can turn the pages. Just one little peek at it. Okay, that's all. Okay, no cheating. No cheating. No cheating. The dark haired boy had something special enough that I decided to follow him to his school the next day. And this is what happened. Um, you actually call this a stamp collection? Yeah. Well, these are real stamps. Yeah. Uh, what's that one up there? Oh, that's my dad's. You can't touch that one. Well, <laughs> come on, come on. Look, look at these. Look at these. Look at, look at mine. Look at these six. Well, come on, just, that's just my get dad. it down. Just, just come on, come on. You're, we're well, good friends, eh? Come as on. I taped this, I was full of a terrible You're tension. Good. Hoping against hope that this remarkable Tommy wouldn't do something to disabuse me of his talent. That he wouldn't mess up in some way. But he didn't. He was perfect. Look at that one. Two of them. Blue nose. No, you can't trade those. Those are his best ones. Well, well, look. Look at these. Look at these. Look at my six ones. Look, he has two of those. Why does he need two? Well, he'll probably get lots of money for it and... Well, your dad's already rich, so he doesn't need money. Come on, I'm, I'm your best friend. I'm running it long because I want money to show you the little things I was watching well, for. Well, Look how stamps. he reacts what when he's asked he get? You get where he got the stamps. I just picked them up here and there. Brilliant. Okay, Thinking so on his feet. Do you want to trade? Well, don't my, ba my dad's. I'd have to ask him. Okay, fine, but if you don't want to... Okay. Oh, okay. But I, I okay. thought we were friends. Okay. Okay. okay, okay, I'll trade you. I'll trade you. Let me see that one more time. You sure you're going to trade now? Yeah, yeah, I'll trade. Tough. I don't want to trade. No, I'll trade. I not only had my actor, but I now knew how to direct the most important scene in the movie. Please. I'll bang on my knees. No, I don't, I don't care. You can. Please. You... I'll trade. No, please. No, no. Trade on top. No, no, no. Well, maybe, but... Well, oh, yes. He had oh, the no, toughness, no. the wrong side of the tracks feel about him. Other things Tell him you've been in trouble, all the things you've been in trouble with the law and everything. You're a real oh, yeah, wild okay. character. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, you know, kind of a tough guy, you know. Really? Always in trouble with the law, running from here to there, and uh, <laughs> all kinds of things, you know. People think I'm a vicious man. 
but he also had sensitivity. Can I see the book? Oh, it, it'll, it'll just be for a little. Um, why do you want to see it? Well, I like stamps. I was on a roll because in the same school was this girl, Jill Stanley, who though she may not have been perhaps the best Nancy that I'd seen, but who related to this Tommy in a way that was absolutely perfect. Fascinated, but wary. Are you still going to be like that? Yeah. Why? Because she had this sideways glance which she idea. threw at him, which really sold me. What do you think's happened to you now? Mm. Nothing really. Yeah, but maybe if you turn to be a nice guy, a nice guy who's, you know, talking not bossy and crazy, like you used to be. What are nice guys going to do? Huh? How would nice guy be anything good? How would be nice help? I was so happy, but I was also sad because there were several other Nancys who I really thought were wonderful. There was the stick up for herself, Nancy. And another one who would take no nonsense, Nancy. They would have no place in the film and would never know how close they came, which is one of the reasons why I have to find them 30 years later and give them back the gift that they gave me. The day that I told the three of them, Albert, Ralph and Tommy, that they had been chosen, their reactions were just priceless. Well, you're chosen. We are? We are? Yes. All, all of us? All of you. Definitely? De definitely? I mean, we're doing really? a movie? Are you serious? What, you want it? Yes, yes. extremely. Definitely, for what? sure. I'd love to be in a movie. It would be a first time beautiful experience. You sure? Are you serious? I've had experience. It was this thing about non actors being so grateful, being so genuinely thrilled. Oh, wake up. <laughs> you okay? Albert okay? was a pain, annoying Tommy, and. Uh, Trying to prove to me how politically <laughs> correct he was. I like to think of myself that... as very smart. And I hate people who are male chauvinist or female chauvinist. For sure. Well, I, sh I, sh I should tell my producer first, but I think it'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah, I showed the producer the videos of you uh, last night. Whoa. I can't, I can't believe this, man. <laughs> you can't believe it. Huh? Can. If it seems all, I'd see, if this was this really real to me, I would be up and jumping up and down, scream, but see, this seems so unrealistic. <laughs> it's, it's so unreal that I'm going to be, I can't I believe, believe that it's true, but I must. It, there, therefore, it has to be true. Things must be true. It has to be. It's positive. Wake up, Andrew. It's Are we, for sure. Are going to be in the I better clean something? these glasses. When I clean oh them, I'll be God. sitting at home, all over the world. right in front oh. of the textbook. <laughs> I'll be, sitting in front, I'll be sitting in front of a textbook when I put these glasses back on. But I'm forgetting the one young lead, Cass, Tommy's dumb friend, who was not found by me, but by his brother. I was in Toronto on the endless Tommy search when this Tommy possibility told me that his brother, who was with him for the audition, could play very dumb. I was skeptical, but there was no need to be. But, but it's wrong to rip them off, right? Give me a break. Of course we're going to rip them off. How else are we going to make business? Are you just going to let them get away, well, sell them? Well, yeah. Couldn't we go go and sell them to, to the kids and, and, then, and then we could sell them to them and they'd be happy and then, and then we'd be happy and we'd have money too, couldn't we? But this way we're making more money. More money, you understand? How? We're selling them for three times the profit. We're going to make more money, understand? But, but, what are we selling? Stamps. <laughs> stamps. Get it through your thick skull. Stamps. S-T-A-M-P. Where are we going to get them? We don't have any stamps. I got stamps. I got them from the <laughs> post office. How much? The, they, they just gave them away like that? And... Oh, what a find was that oh boy. Oh, my goodness. You After that, we had to find the adults, 
And that was easy because I was not going to use amateurs but draw on the great pool of talent in Montreal. There was a packet here with a blue nose in it. You know what we said about trust? Except in the case of the stamp shop. I wanted a real stamp dealer. And uh, it was actually at that stamp convention where I found the sort of threat that I needed because I wanted somebody who could be scary. As I was talking to this guy, suddenly somebody said something from the side and he exploded. And I knew that he was the one. Not get into this tonight. Not tonight. Not after the display in this bloody hall tonight. Hi, guys. Uh oh. There's troubles. How's the liquor secretary? Where did my piece set you stole two weeks ago? You're giving this place a bad name, and you're giving stamp collecting a bad name. Me? Yeah, you. Actually, there was another amateur in the shop, and that was Tom Robertson, who my assistant Lois had discovered. Tom added a lovely comic element to the proceedings. Yeah, what do you got there, Sid? Your father was telling me... Mr. Bronson. I wonder if he was a professional. I can't remember, actually. Not that much. Stamps are amazing. They can lift a tiny postcard or a huge parcel and fly it around the world. As we got closer to production, music was an issue. I knew the Garrigal sisters and was convinced that their brand of music would be just great. Kate McGarrigal said, well, I've got a son, 11-year-old Rufus, who uh, is going to be really good one day, and uh, he could write you a song, which he did. As you can imagine, I'm sorry now that I didn't offer him a larger role. There's just one sadness which I hesitate to share with you, actually. And that is, on the day of Tommy's audition, he did a superbly sad and touching scene about his drunken dad. Oh, I'm really sorry. I didn't know. It's not his fault. So what about your mom? Just, it's all on me now. I have to do everything. And he just sort of reminded you of him. I try and be tough so nobody will know. But, but in the actual movie, it never got to that same level of feeling, which is one of the, the downsides of working with amateurs okay. because when it's no longer real for them, when they've done it too much, it dies. So we found the kids in China, auditioned them in the same way, improvs. And speaking of China, there's one piece of huge unfinished business for me. And that is to find Wang Zhaogun, the boy who started all this. Well, he's not a boy now. He's in his 40s, I guess. And I'm pretty sure that he doesn't know about Tommy Tricker, never seen the movie, and certainly doesn't know of the vital part he played. I have to find him. We put together a fantastic uh, crew, very much the work of Rock and um, line producer Anne Burke, and including my dear friend Andreas Poulsen as DOP. Wonderful people all. <laughs> what fun we had. been imagining that this is a film about the making of Tommy Trigger. Actually it's not. What it's really about is the magic of improvisation and my firm conviction that this is something that should be done all the time with kids. That all they need is a, the slightest thread to set them off on great adventures and creativity. Oh, what's that? and self-realization. No. Well, okay. 
As you saw, I gave every child in every class a chance. And there were very few that could not unlock themselves using the thread of a story. Having got that off my chest, I'm very happy to report that the film brought stamp collecting as a hobby back to life. In fact, a year or two later, I got a gold medal from the Quebec Philatelic Society for services to the hobby. How good is that? Thanks to everybody who worked on the film, it was so much fun, especially my producer, Rock DeBass.